Lord God, I just want to thank you, Father, again for this time that you give us that we can open and share your word together. God, I pray for Keith as he brings your message, your truth today. God, speak through him in such an incredible way that we can hear the voice of Jesus speaking to each and every one of us directly. I thank you for that in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, Greg. It's a privilege to be here today. Some of you I know, some of you I don't know. When I preach at a church for the first time, and some folks said, this is the first time? It's like, yeah, I've spoken to the youth before. Uh, I've never preached here. But I know when I'm sitting in the audience and someone gets up to preach, and it's like, who is this guy? You know, it's, it's kind of like when you're in a conversation with a friend, and someone walks by and hears a word, and they jump into your conversation, they become the expert. And you go, who are you, and why are you here? So real quickly, I grew up in Lake Charles on Auburn Street, a block from the Cormies, across the street from Andy, who led our worship today. Went to LaGrange High School, went to McNeese, became a certified public accountant, was a deacon at Trinity. And in 1977, God placed his hand on me and called me to do ministry, which sounded crazy at 27 years old. Went to Southwestern Seminary. God did incredible things there through missions, things that should not have happened, happened, played basketball all over the world, got a theology degree, had no experience in campus ministry, felt like that's what God wanted me to do. And a man from Mississippi comes and says, we want you to come to Ole Miss. And before we get the response, (laughs) they need missionaries in Mississippi to learn about Jesus. (laughs) I've, I've served there 20 years. We built a new building there. Felt like God was moving me. I moved to New Orleans, to Tulane, and I was the city director in New Orleans. Katrina hits. I became a relief worker because I had no students. I got sick, had a blood clot in my liver, didn't know if I would make it out. Spent three weeks in Tulane Hospital. David Hankins came and said, you want to go back home? I said, yeah, I probably do. So I moved to, to McNeese in 2006, served here for 11 and a half years, built another building here. Uh, again, God did incredible things in the ministry here. So that's kind of who I am, that I've been around. My, some of you who are really old, my dad, if you bought a Chevrolet from Cagle Chevrolet, my dad probably took your money. He was an accountant also. Uh, all my brothers are accountants. Uh, it's kind of the family thing, so I'm the black sheep. I, I left the accounting profession to go into uh, to ministry. This morning we're looking at chapter 8 of Mark. I want to begin reading in verse 34. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man, for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes to his Father's glory with the holy angels. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for your word. I pray that you would guide my words today. You give us receptive hearts to hear what you'd have us to know. Continue to work in our church, Father. Be with the pastor search committee as they look for the the person who will lead our church in the days ahead. That we would be able to accomplish great things, not for us, but for your kingdom. That you would be, your name would be made known around the world and in this city. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. How much is enough? You know, if, if we ask... Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, Warren Buffett. Do they have enough? They, they may say they have enough. But how much is enough for us? Always more. But you know, you can only drive one car at a time. You can only live in one house at a time. You can only sleep in one bed at a time. Do we have enough? I used to tell students, if you drive a vehicle, if you have a car, it can be a beater. 
if you have a car, you're in the richest 8% of people in the world. And yet we think, oh, my house isn't big enough. My car is not nice enough. I, I need a little bit more. I need a, need a little bit more. There was a man who lived hundreds of years before Jesus. His name was Alexander the Great. He studied under Aristotle. He had the largest empire in the world by the age of 30. And he died at age 32. His last wishes are interesting to me. He had three wishes. He said, first of all, doctors were to carry his coffin to prove that even they could not heal him. Secondly, the road was to be covered with treasures to show that those treasures were staying on earth and he was gone. And the third thing was he wanted his hands loose outside the casket to show that we come into the world empty-handed and we leave the world empty-handed. Now, he was not a religious man, but he came to understand it's not about money. Actually, he would have probably said time was the most important thing because he ran out of time at a very early age. Jesus answers the question before he gives it, actually. But I want to back up a few verses before this. In verse 22, Jesus heals a blind man. And it's an interesting healing because it's, it's different. He touches the man's eyes and he says, can you see? And he says, well, I see people, but they look like trees. And Jesus touches him another time. The two stages of healing. A little different than what we've seen before. And he's going to ask the question, but first of all, and essentially the 12 have been with him the whole time. He's about halfway through his ministry at this point. And typically what he would do was call the disciples aside and say, okay, here's the real deal. I'm going to preach to the crowds, but I want to let you know where I'm going, what's going on. He told them very plainly that he was going to die. And what does Peter do? Jesus, come here, let me talk to you. You're wrong. Now, before we be too hard on Peter, there are times that we do that. Don't we? we hear a word from God. And go, no, no, God, no, you can't really mean that. Let me straighten you out. And at this point, Jesus doesn't just talk to the disciples. It says he calls the crowd in. Now, some of you rem will remember the movie Dead Poet Society. Robin Williams is a, is a teacher in a private school. He's very passionate about literature, and he calls the boys in. Come in close, come in close, listen. And what does he say? Seize the day. And I think Jesus is going to give us the secret. How do you seize the day? What, what do I really want you to do? Do I want you to confess me as... Lord and Savior, Son of God, as Peter did? Yes. That's part of it. But the second part is found in verse 34. As he calls them in, he says, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Three things that we're called to do. And then we'll answer the question, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? This is how you save your soul, is you walk with Jesus. You know, in the Great Commission, what does he call us to do? Does he call us to confess him? No, he calls us to make disciples. Who are the disciples? The, tw the disciples gave their lives to follow Christ. They gave up their life as they knew it, you know, John, James, Peter, Andrew could have had a pretty successful fishing business. But they heard the truth of Jesus and they said, nope, Dad, I'll, we'll see you later. I always wonder what their dad would have thought about that. Who's going to run the business now? And they're going, there, there are better things than the business. There are better things than making money and it's following this man named Jesus. So deny yourself is giving up the things that you want. Thinking not about number one. 
which is how we're raised, a lot of us. Uh, my dad was a part of the greatest generation, wanted us to succeed. And I remember his boss always saying, there's only one quarterback on the team. And he'd point to himself, I'm, I'm the one, I'm the one. And he was very successful. But we're called not to think about ourselves, but to look at the world from Christ's perspective. Do you have enough? You know, some folks said, man, you gave up a great career in accounting. And I've had a wonderful ride. Live in a great house that's paid for, two vehicles that are paid for, making more money now in retirement than I made when I was working. It's like, that, that's not much sacrifice. But because, because I denied myself, he did things, and I'm not going to enumerate things here, but he did things that, that I could never imagine that I would do. So deny yourself, take up your cross. The cross was an instrument of death. You know, we see it as a symbol on the wall. Uh, some people wear it around their neck. It was a nasty way to die. The Persians had begun crucifying folks, 600 B.C. Alexander the Great actually learned from them this method of torture and, and death. And the Romans learned it from him. And so the Romans this time are crucifying folks. So when he said, take up your cross, it wasn't, oh, let me bear this burden, you know, that I, that I have in life. This person is, a, is a, a pain to me and I have to put up with them or I have to struggle with paying these bills. No. Are you willing to die is what he was saying. And they understood that. That if you follow Jesus, you could possibly be killed for your faith. And it didn't matter. Paul wrote in Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live now, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. Are we willing to be crucified for the sake of Christ? And the third thing is to follow him. You know, there's some pretty smart people in this room today, very successful people in this room together today. I'm amazed. I was thinking recently, because I'm guilty of this. Most times, if I walk into a room and people are talking, I think, well, I'm smarter than they are. If they just listen to me. And, of course, every other person in the room thinks the same thing, so we don't agree on much. So we think, and we are in the world today, we're successful. But the thing that I learned when I left that career, he had a much better plan for me than I ever dreamt of. Do you think you're smarter than God? You're pretty smart, but you're smarter than he is. The people, the Jews in that day, were looking for the Messiah. And Jesus wasn't the kind of Messiah they were looking for. They wanted a political leader, military leader, who would come and just take charge. And they wouldn't have to do anything. The Messiah would take care of everything for them. And they could go on living how they wanted to live in disobedience to the Jewish law of that day. Jesus called them to a life of obedience and discomfort. It wasn't comfortable to follow him. You know, you're sleeping on the side of the road probably. Didn't know where your next meal was coming from. After his death, there was persecution. It's not a very comfortable thing to follow Christ. And there are some parallels in the world today, aren't there? We want Jesus to come back and make everything right. Well, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to be his disciple? Are you going to study his word? Are you going to share the faith? Are you going to do these things? Well, no, that's, his, that's the disciples. That's the Messiah's job, not my job. No, he calls us to do those three things. I have a friend who disciples young men. And one of the guys that he had invested in for a year or two met this young lady. 
who my friend didn't think was really a good match for her. She wasn't walking with Christ. But this, this young man was smitten with her. And he said, I, I, I can't meet with you anymore. And he said, let me ask you a question. Would you give up everything for this girl? Your relationship with Christ? The whole thing? Yeah. She's really the thing. And so he, he went his way. He left it. I preached in Tupelo, Mississippi years ago. And I still remember preaching this message on following Christ. And after the service, this young man came up. And this was at a, a, a disciple now. So I'm, I'm aiming my message at teenagers. And this young man, who's probably in his mid-30s, comes up afterwards and says, can I talk to you for a second? Yeah, sure. He said, you're, you're preaching to me today. What do you mean? Well, God called me to be a junior high football coach and a history teacher. But my parents said, you'll never make any money doing that. And so I'm an attorney now. Have a successful practice. But I know that I should have been obedient when he called me to follow him. And he said, it's too late now. I tried to explain to him, no, it's not too late. I don't think it's too late for any of us to do what God calls us to do. I had a young man in my ministry named Matt. Matt came from a well-to-do family in Columbus, Mississippi. His father was an entrepreneur, had 13 Sonic restaurants. In the summers, Matt would go home and work for his daddy. Well, Jesus got in Matt's face, and Matt was obedient. He had to go home and tell his daddy. He said, Daddy, I can't come back in the business. God's called me to be a missionary. He spent one summer in North Africa and realized that was the part of the world he needed to be in. Went to seminary, got married. He and his wife went to the Middle East, into a closed country where he couldn't even tell you where he was. And serve the Lord. Because he understood that making a difference in people's lives was more important than making money. How do you do this stuff? When I was probably 13 years old, I'd been a believer for a year, year and a half. My preacher would talk about what we needed to do. You need to witness more. Yeah, I need to witness more. You need to read your Bible more. Yes. You need to sin less. Yes. Share your faith. And I remember I always sat in the back of the church. And I'm going, how did I do that? I wanted to raise my hand. But I was in a Southern Baptist church, and they would have thought I was charismatic if I raised my hand back then. But I wanted to say... How do you do this? I'm guilty. It's charged. How do you do this? And that's when I began to seek discipleship. And when I went to seminary, I, this isn't very spiritual, but I was going to join a church in seminary. And I loved playing basketball. So I said, which churches in Fort Worth have a basketball gym? There were two churches that had gyms. One was the most liberal church in town, and one was one of the most conservative I went to the conservative one first on a Sunday. I said, do guys play basketball? He said, yeah, Monday night. So I went Monday night. I never made it to the other church. But that church also had an incredible collegiate ministry. And the, they asked me to, to join the ministry. And I was a small group leader. And I, another really spiritual job. I drove the bus from TCU to the church every Sunday morning at, at 8 o'clock. But the college minister asked us to compile some discipleship materials. Scripture memory, accountability, just basic, spiritual basics that I used for 20 years at Ole Miss. Not long after I got at Ole Miss, 
Master Life came out, and I began to use Master Life. I probably led a thousand people through Master Life through the years. And Master Life is just teaching people how to spend time in the Word, pray in faith, fellowship with believers, and witness to the world. This sermon is for you guys, but it's for me too. This summer, I was talking to some of the guys involved in the uh, men's ministry. I said, you know, I've been retired for six years. It's time for me to do something. So I want to try to get a couple guys and disciple them and show them how, because I think that's something we lack, is showing people how do you actually walk with Christ in a small group setting. This isn't for everybody. Jesus knew when he made this call to these people, not everyone was going to do it, believe in it, not everyone was going to follow him, but if you just have a few who become disciples, it becomes contagious. My first semester at Ole Miss, I was a babe. Didn't know what I was doing, but I knew discipleship. And I prayed that whole summer. I got there in May. I prayed that in August, that, Lord, would you give me five students who would take seriously this call and spend the whole semester with me, memorizing Scripture, praying together, holding one another accountable. 28 students signed up, and I was overwhelmed. And, and I was convinced to do it in small groups. I had six different small groups that I led. I knew the Scriptures backwards and forwards. And it began to grow, and, and that, but that became the thing to do. And I think that should be the thing that we, as believers, just do normally that we're memorizing Scripture, that we have a prayer partner, we have a, a small group that we're accountable to that helps us not go the way of the world because it's really easy to go the way of the world. Calvin Miller is deceased now. I loved his writing, got to meet him a couple of times. In his book, The Taste of Joy, he said millions of Christians are miserable and don't understand why. They went to a church. They were promised this Christ life that would solve everything. They walked down front. They joined the church. And they felt warm and fuzzy for a period. And then slowly, the attention wasn't on them. No one tried to disciple them. And they would slowly drift out the back doors living a frustrated life of, I, I thought this Christ thing was going to help. And it didn't. In every other area of life, we understand that discipline is necessary. In, in academics, the only person who's not happy on report card day is the one who didn't study. In athletics, the one who's always losing is the one who didn't go to practice much, didn't spend time in the weight room, do the things that are necessary. In music, you can't be a concert pianist if you practice once a week. And yet in Christianity, we think, well, if I come and sit for an hour a week and I give some money to the church, I'll be okay. If we're going to be disciples of Christ, that implies discipline in our lives, that we will... Take some steps to improve our walk with Christ and become the people that he wants us to be. One of my friends who passed a couple years ago at 102 was part of the Wheaton Revival in 1935. And I was so fortunate to know Dr. Norton and to ask him questions about that. The, the moving of the Spirit there, and the res, result of people who went to the mission field, and not just the mission, but people who were professors in the Big Ten at some of the top schools who used that platform to share the gospel. My prayer is that we would have that kind of movement. Not an emotional thing, but a decision to say, I'm going to follow Christ. You see, in, in this world, there are only three things that last. God, God's Word, 
and human souls. Where are you investing your time? I want to invest in those three things in order that God would make a difference. Paul addresses this in 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. He's talking to Timothy. He says, Timothy, the things you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable men who will be qualified to teach others also. So Paul talks to Timothy who says, teach others who teach others after that. Four generations of discipleship. Are we willing to invest in folks so that our legacy is not how much money we leave behind for a good cause, but how many people we leave behind? My good friend Dave Gwynn, I, we did Olympic ministry. He wrestled in 68 Olympics. And he taught me so much about that. He said, man, we, we've got to invest for eternity. It doesn't matter. As he would say, the, the medals he won, they didn't matter. And he would ask me, who, who are your spiritual grandchildren? Not your children, not the ones that you discipled. Who are your spiritual grandchildren? The people you poured into, the other one, the next generation. And he had several folks. He was at Baylor University for a while, and for a, a good while, actually. But he said, yeah, one of my spiritual grandchildren children came up today or great grandchildren and they would say you don't know me Mr. Gwynn but you discipled Mike and Mike discipled Bob and Bob discipled me but they talked about you about the legacy that you had in their lives that's the way the gospel is going to impact our area I think it's great that people confess Christ but when we take seriously the claims of discipleship God will pour out his blessings on us. And I've told students this, well, since I moved back here in 06. I'm convinced that God wants to work in southwest Louisiana because we're not much. We're not in New York City, Los Angeles, Chicago. People don't expect much from us. In general, we're not that educated. So if God moves... It's not going to be because we're so bright. It's because he's God. And he gets the glory for it. And that's my prayer for us. If you need to make a commitment today to follow Christ for the first time, you may not even know Christ. You may be one of those who are in the crowd and need to make a profession, a confession of Christ as Savior. Today's the day to do that. Some may say, hey, Keith, you're right. I'm not investing in other people. When I look at this room, there are, there are folks who are extremely talented. Some in the past have done great things for the kingdom and just said, well, you know, I'm going to let somebody else take over for that now. As long as I have breath to live, I'm called to be a disciple. That there shouldn't be no retirement in those matters. And so if you feel that you need to make a commitment today, Greg will be down front. Andy's going to lead us in a song in just a minute. I finished a little bit quicker than he thought I would. But let me pray for us. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for Jesus' calling of us to be disciples, not just spectators. Lord, he's invited us to be a part of his work. May we be obedient to him and be instruments in this community Lord I pray that you'd use our church our members to take seriously these claims and to touch our community Lord there are folks out there who, who are asking that question how do I do this we have the answers and sometimes we sit on our hands instead of stepping forward I pray that we would step forward and be obedient to your word and I ask you in Christ's name. Amen.